for now. So these are dates to serve, not just mark calendars to attend. We don't have everything on here. Um, but the areas where we really need service, that's what these dates are for. And so I'm hoping that you'll take this, put it either on the refrigerator or in your Bible or your journal or car, so that you know where you can serve with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service. So. Um, this is a good opportunity to do that, and um, on this you'll see where there are dates even at the end of the year. So as you're planning your family vacations, my hope and request as this, the members of this church is that you would tailor those around, your trips and your vacations around the things going on in the life of the church so that you can participate in the ministries and life of this church. We are also in the middle of our stewardship campaign. Uh, by now you should should have received a letter um, in the mail for me and from our finance team telling you just a little bit about uh, where we ended the year and how things have been going and then um, also asking for you to make a commitment through a pledge and you can do that electronically online we have a button on our website we also have um, a button on our mobile app for you to do your pledging online or you can fill out this card and return it the goal is that over the next couple of weeks as you and your family prayerfully um, think about and consider what your commitment is for 2024 with your financial gifts, um, that you're also thinking about how you live into that vow to faithfully participate in the ministries of this church with your prayers and your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. Setting the year up right and thinking through how do you do that. And so if you're currently not regular in giving, perhaps that's the first step. And you just make the commitment that we are not going to be regular in our giving. Maybe it is every week or every first of the month. Or um, maybe if it, it's um, sporadic in your amount 
and it kind of varies based on what's going on in your life and the time of year, perhaps that's the commitment you make to God. I'm going to be more consistent in my giving, and it's going to be the first thing I do each month is to make that commitment. So that's unique for each person. There is on the back of this pledge card a chart that helps guide you through if you think about your um, income for your family and yourself. Um, what does 2% look like? What does 5% look like? What does 6%? What does 10% look like of your income? So fill that out and turn that in to us. We'll keep that confidential um, and private, but it helps us set up our ministries and budget for the year as well. Um, and then also, we're about to start our Lenten season. This Wednesday, February 14th, is Ash Wednesday. We are having an interactive worship experience. Anytime from noon to 8, we, we kept backing it up a little earlier and a little earlier because we know we have people who are already here at 11 a.m. We already have people, a group that's going to be here at noon this Wednesday. And then this way, they can come right from that activity into the worship experience to go through our interactive Ash Wednesday experience. Um, it's different from a traditional service, but I think that you'll really like it. I think it'll be deep and meaningful, and it will set the tone for your Lenten journey with Jesus uh, this season. Also, on that note, we are beginning our six-week study called Remember, and we're focusing on the different covenants that God has with God's people um, throughout the season of Lent. And so we'll have a study beginning this coming Thursday morning at 10 a.m., and then also next Wednesday evening at 6 p.m., and then you can get into those studies. So also, you should figure out which, which time works best for you, um, but it's an encouragement for you because it's really nice if we can set the tone for this preparation season as we head towards Easter. Uh, a quick note, too, I will not be here next Sunday. I am leading a women's retreat at the Pro Throw Center at Lake Texoma all weekend, next weekend, and so um, I will be doing a different worship service next Sunday morning at a different location. So Owen Ross will be here next Sunday to guest preach, and I am asking for y'all to be welcoming and encouraging to him um, and to be here. And last but not least, we are wrapping up our drive for Helping Hands, our Super Bowl, um, Super Bowl soup, stew, chili type thing, meal thing. And I have to say, right now, it just looks like for a little while, um, the Chiefs and the 49ers are kind of tied when it comes to our camp, so I don't know, maybe just have no interest in the teams that are playing or um, you just haven't yet brought those in. But we're wanting to take those items to the food pantry this coming week. So if you have not brought those in or if you keep forgetting, it does technically end today. If you want to bring those by tomorrow or Tuesday, we'll make sure we get them over to Helping Hands. So as you're going grocery shopping, as you're shopping for Super Bowl snacks and foods today, grab some stew or some soup or some chili and we'll get those over to the food pantry because I know they'll appreciate it. All right, with all of that. I ask for you to center your hearts and minds as we prepare ourselves for a spirit of worship and welcome the Holy Spirit in this place. And we stand as we are able, mind, body, and spirit for our Apostles' Creed. And we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose from the dead. He descended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
one is who who wants Chiefs? Raise your hand. Who wants what? The Chiefs. What about 49ers? Who doesn't care? <laughs> <laughs> it's the Taylor Swift Bowl anyway, so it's good. <laughs> Jordan, do you want to say Jordan had a robotics competition yeah. yesterday and they, you made state? Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, you won first place. Isn't that awesome? That's so cool. the excellence trophies. The excellence trophy. That's awesome. Isn't your mom the, the coach too? Yes. Go Katie. Go Katie. All right, um, and we have a very special birthday that we're going to sing at the end, Lucas. Okay, so let's get to it because we are going to start back at the light training today. So the kids get excited. Woo! Okay, so we left off in Jonah 3. Does anyone remember what happened? Yes, Jacob. He got swallowed by a fish and he was in there for three days and then the fish, um, like, did something then like he washed up on land. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And then what happened after that? Anyone remember? He barfed him out. He barfed him out. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Then they, the people repented. Remember we wore the sackcloth last week and the people repented and they turned back to God. So now we're in the last part of Jonah in our series and for Jonah 4. And so Jonah wasn't happy. He was like a little baby. Like this is what I think I think of him laying on the ground like, like a total toddler. Like I'm not happy. You're not supposed to forgive them. I want them to suffer. But I want you to forgive me. So let's read uh, Jonah 2. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, is this not what I said? I was yet in my country. That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. And I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah didn't want the Ninevites to give the same grace that, that, that Jonah got. He was like, ah, I'm better than them, God, don't you know? So God's like, mm, I don't think so. I think they were all the same. So Jonah went out to the city, and he sat to the east and made a booth for himself there, like a, like a little shelter of sticks. He sat under it in the shade till he should till he should see what would be of the city. He was like hoping that the city was gonna go up in flames, he was gonna watch a firework show, and guess what, God did not do that. God's like, I am forgiving you people, you've turned back to me. So Jonah goes in this shelter type 10, and he says, now the Lord appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that made it a shade over his head. Remember, it was very hot to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of this plant. So he's in this shelter, and, and God grows this plant to give him shelter so it doesn't burn his head. And so here we go. Now the Lord appointed a plant made it come over Jonah. Jonah's mad, now he's happy. He has a plant hanging in shade. You know, he's sitting there and he's like, okay, things are good. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah, so that he was faint, and he asked that he might die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry from the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. So Jonah's like, I would rather die than watch this anymore. He's, he's, he's like I said, he's like a, a pouting teenager. And God's like, Jonah, come on, dude. Like, I saved you once. Let's be happy for other people here, okay? So God's heart is for all people. We're commanded to love God and then love others. Jonah's heart was for himself and his own people. He loved God, but he struggled loving others. Jonah disobeyed. He was selfish, and he sinned just like you and me. He put his feelings first, but just like what we do. But God still loved and used Jonah, and he still loves us, too. So, 
Isn't that such an awesome story, Jonas? You know you guys are gonna really understand it and it's gonna be in four weeks to do it. So let's get to our training, but first let's stand up and we're gonna sing happy birthday to Lucas. All right, ready, Lucas? <laughs> you don't care for very much, people who have been harmful and rude to you. Um, that is going to be our challenge each and every week, but that is the ultimate focus of our lesson from the book of Jonah. And so we, of course, pray for um, those who have been hospitalized and coming out of um, those kind of surgery situations and on their road to recovery, including Javier and Lydia Escalera. And we also want to pray for those who have upcoming surgeries in the next week, two weeks, a uh, couple weeks. And so in particular, we want to pray for Gary Devecchio, and we want to pray for Martha Penson. And we want to pray for people we haven't seen in our church in a long time. Um, I know some of those people, you know some people, so I want you to look around and you haven't seen some of those people, I encourage you to reach out and just let them know that we are thinking of them and that they are our midst. We want to pray for those who have been battling cancer. And so we had um, a real struggle this week with our little Voyager preschool program, and that we learned of two. Uh, and that was really very hard. We want to pray for um, Warner Frankham. He is a little boy in our preschool class who has just been diagnosed this last weekend with leukemia. And so he's beginning treatment. Um, and the family of Shannon and Eric Frankham, as they weather that and kind of work through what those treatment options look like, he immediately started chemo and was pretty responsive and was doing a lot better already, um, just being able to be in the hospital and have the treatment and fluids he needs. But also we want to lift up and pray for one of our teachers um, who's just been diagnosed with cancer, uh, Courtney Hansen. And then also, in, through our little Voyager's preschool, um, a little girl's mom um, who was recently diagnosed with cancer, Leanne Peterson. So we want to pray for Leanne and Warner and Courtney. We want to continue for praying for those who've been recovering from cancer and are still working through the healing process of that and still have um, some treatment to go, and that includes Joe Vaughn and Martha Penson. We want to pray for a peaceful resolution in the wars that are going on in our world. And this week, I would urge you to pray for Hamas. I would urge you to pray for Putin. I would urge you to pray for those that we deem um, unworthy of our prayers, unworthy of God's grace. We pray for our president, our community leaders, our world leaders. And then just right before I came up here, we received, our prayer team received a text message urgently um, asking for prayers for Mackenzie Halbert. Um, Kara said, this is a major thing right now and we need to all pray for her. So please hold Mackenzie in your prayers. And um, a quick update, Clark was able to get his shot for some pain relief. He's hoping that will kick in really soon, but continue to pray for Clark McCabe. Who else do we need lift up from our congregation who need prayers by name? Frank Salvedo. Thank you, Kathy. Frank Salvedo. Yes. Joe. Uh, my sister, Carol. Carol? What's Carol's last name? Murphy. Oh, Murphy. Dana Gillen? Yes. Claire Gorman. 
Claire Gordon. Nancy. Sherry Nutton. Sherry Knight. Thank you for lifting up those names. I think it makes such a difference when we as a community gather together in prayer. So holding all those names in our hearts, let us go now to God in prayer. Oh God, you are so gracious with your mercy and your faithfulness to us and your love, your love that is made available for all, for you are our light and our salvation. When we live in your presence, when we embrace who you are and who we are in our, our image that you created then, we know that we have nothing to fear. So God, open our hearts to the prayer requests, the ones that cause us great pain on behalf of empathy for those who are needing your healing grace this day in this very moment, God. We lift up these names to you. We also ask for you to soften our hearts when it's really difficult to utter a name of someone that we feel like doesn't deserve your grace and your mercy. Someone who has harmed us or someone that we love. We pray for them now as well. Forgive us, God. Forgive us, God, when the very many times that we turn away from you and we turn to our own selfish desires. Even the most faithful do this. For we learn a lot from the story of Jonah. We learn a lot from, from your scriptures that show us time and time again the ways of um, us are not often in alignment with you. So cast aside our doubts. Cast aside our fears. Help us, teach us to trust wholly in you. And thank you, God, for your persistence. Thank you for your responsiveness in our prayers. Heal those who need your healing today. We lifted up all these names. We have uttered the names in our hearts and situations that it would just even bring our hearts to speak. And we trust that you are responding. So respond with your healing. Touch your grace. And as our, we have offered our prayers up this day, be with us. Guide us in our week beyond just the Sunday to be your people, to be people who show others grace and love and compassion, even when it's difficult for us to do. For we can only do this by your power and your help each and every day. So we turn to you, O oh God. Hear our prayers. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Will our ushers please come forward? We're trying to remind ourselves and, and one another what it's like to live and participate faithfully in the ministries of the church. And um, one of those ways is to remember just kind of who we are and um, that with our gifts, those come from the Holy Spirit, all of our, our gifts, not just our financial gifts. And we recognize um, God in our midst, but sometimes we can limit that to just Sundays and seeing God. And so each and every week we're trying to lift up a God moment story, and I will encourage you to think about where you see God today, where you see God tomorrow, where you see God in the ordinary that makes that moment extraordinary, to pause and reflect on it, especially as we enter the season of Lent. And then if you could, share that with us so that we can share it with one another. And so each and every Wednesday when we send out our email, you're seeing a God moment story. But so far, those have been from our staff. And so I am hopeful that you will share your story with us. And that helps us all be more alert and awake to God's working and moving in our lives. So if you have some time this week, share your God moment with us. It doesn't have to be very lengthy, just a paragraph or so to tell us where you see God. And that becomes part of your story. It becomes part of our story and our witness out into the world. So I just want to take that moment to highlight that opportunity because it reminds us of what our story is all about and that we have common ground. Will, we, will you please bow your heads for our prayer? God, we pray a blessing over these tithes and offerings. It is 
all but a portion of what you give to us, for your love is so abundant in our lives. Help us to open our eyes and see you at work, to see that you are the source of all of this goodness in our lives, so that we can go out into the world and share that goodness with others. Make them more aware of it as well, and in turn, become more generous, more faithful, more compassionate, more joyful, more loving, and more patient. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarsh Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishment, from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, it is right for you to be angry. Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from the discomfort. So, Jan <clears throat> so Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when the dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attached, attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it's better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, it is right for you to be angry about the bush. And he said, yes, angry to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and for which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And will I not be concerned about Nineveh? That great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Ernie. You may be seated. We forget how abruptly Jonah ends with this question from God to Jonah. Question that we ponder today. So let us pray. God of grace and mercy, I ask you again this morning to open up this text to us today as we reach the end of Jonah's parable and his story, his lesson. This is a story, oh God, that most of us think we know. This is a story that we have pictured in our heads because we've seen the illustrations since our childhood. And we know the general outline that a fish eats a man who lives, but we rarely make it to Jonah chapter 4. And so God, help us today to see past the fish and understand what the story of Jonah teaches us. Teaches us about you and teaches us about ourselves. Amen. Today is our last day to study in the book of Jonah. It's this tiny little book of about just 48 verses, four chapters, and we're spending four weeks in it because I think that we tend to overlook it. We, we see that chapter heading or that book heading Jonah, and we're like, oh, I already know the story, and we move on. In the first chapter, Jonah runs as far as possible, as far away from God's presence as he can get. And he, he says, I am not going to do what you're asking me to do, and I refuse to answer the call in my life. I would rather die than go to Nineveh. And he reinforces that in chapter 4, as you just heard of Ernie read as well. And so four weeks ago, or three weeks ago, we asked that reflecting question, what is our Nineveh? Where are we running from God's presence? Where are we running in the opposite direction of where God is calling us to go? And in the second week, we saw that Jonah refused to own up to his behavior, his behavior that landed him on a boat, that landed him in the bottom of an ocean or inside the belly of a fish. And Jonah whined and he complained all about what God had done to him. And he basically complained and threw a fit, like a, a little bit of, of a toddler throwing a tantrum. But in spite of this, God swoops in 
and it gives him a safe place to sit in this womb type of environment for three days. And Jonah's subterranean situation was a reminder that God's saving mercy extended to us always when it's undeserved, always when it's most needed, but often always, I would say almost always, underappreciated, even when we can't recognize that it's goodness um, for our lives. And last week, we put ourselves in the Ninevites' shoes. So we switch gears a little bit and we put ourselves in their shoes. And together we wonder, we wonder uh, if we'd be so quick to respond to God's saving message. Would we be like Nineveh? Are we ready to repent and change our ways when God gives us a message, change or else, change or be overthrown? Of course, when we dug deeper, we see the beauty of that word and that complexity of that word that is translated for us as overthrown. And that word means both destruction and deliverance. And so we saw how Nineveh participated. They're the recipient and also the agent of that destruction and that deliverance. Nineveh is overthrown by God as they are willing to participate and turn over their lives to God and away from harmful things. And so we, this morning, once again, we place ourselves back in Jonah's shoes. And as Jonah, I would like to think that we're all hopeful and excited about what just happened in Nineveh. It's why I had uh, Ernie go back and read chapter 3, verse 10 for us to remind us what it was that God did and what Nineveh did and turned from the rays. We would like to think that as Jonah, we're going to be happy for them. But sadly, we're not. And Jonah, as we see, continues to be incredibly selfish. God has just relented from the destruction that he warned Nineveh about. And uh, Jonah's response is anger. He is so angry at God, and I really can't blame him. Remember, Nineveh is this capital of Assyria, the people who, who is this ancient superpower, they uh, too much power for their own good, and they invaded Israel. They threw all the people into an exile state. Um, they have been murderous. They have been horrible. They don't even worship God. And so to Jonah, God's mercy towards these pagan people, it's, it's not just that it's unjust, it's dangerous. If they're allowed to survive and allowed to thrive, they're going to just return to their old ways, and they're going to come back and do it again. And so in Hebrew, Jonah calls God's mercy, he calls it evil. And we call from Jonah chapter 1, Jonah said he didn't want to go to Nineveh because he knew God will show God's love to uh, uh, all of Nineveh, that God would forgive them, that God would see them repent and completely, basically just trust that repentance. They're not going to be evil people anymore. They're going to be forgiven. And they're people that he hates. I want you to think for just a moment about what we've got going on in Israel right now, right? Just think of modern-day Israel for just a moment. Imagine if God asked Benjamin Netanyahu to go to the Gaza Strip and to speak a prophetic word to Hamas. I mean, first of all, to go there, to this place he doesn't want to go, and speak to Hamas about changing their ways. And this is a, a group that's a huge enemy to Israel. They have openly said that they reject Israel's existence completely reject their existence. But what if Benjamin goes and he speaks this truth to them about God's goodness and faithfulness and then Hamas completely repented and changed their ways. They stopped their violent acts. They become this great city that God says that they are. How do you think Benjamin would feel? Do you think he'd let go of all that anger? I mean, this is exactly what Jonah is in in this situation. It's how he felt about Nineveh. He didn't want to be complicit in Jonah and Nineveh's salvation. Jonah said, I would rather die than live and watch God show mercy to those people towards Israel's enemies. And God asked, is it right for you to be angry that this happened? And Jonah's only response, he doesn't even answer God right away, he just turns away and exits stage left, and he immediately leaves the city, and he goes and sits on top of a hilltop. This is a guy who wanted to flee as far from Nineveh as possible, but now he wants to sit on a hilltop, and he wants to brood, and he wants to watch and see if there's going to be destruction. He wants to revel in their misery. 
right? He wants to sit and wait for God to renege on God's mercy and destroy the city. But instead, God is merciful, and the city is thriving and seeming to do fine, and they're turning away from their evil ways. God is merciful to Jonah at that moment in his brooding, and he creates this big shade plant to cover him on that hot day. In scripture, it says that this bush eased his discomfort. But when you look at that Hebrew phrase there, the same phrase can also mean that bush saved him from evil. Saved him from evil. God uses that plant to expose Jonah's hateful heart. Okay, it creates that plant that reminds Jonah of all of God's goodness. And this is the person that calls, calls God's mercy evil. And God is there for him. And then as he's still brooding, the next morning God sends a worm to destroy that land. He sends that brutal east wind that sweeps in. The sun is beating down. Anything to create further discomfort for Jonah. And Jonah says, all right, yeah, see, I want to die because this is how awful you are. I just want to die. And my life has no point of living because look at what I just helped do. I helped bring them to salvation. I was an instrument of their peace. And I didn't want to do that. He's angry because of what God has done and that God has taken away the mercy of that plant in that moment. And hoping to expose Jonah's hypocrisy, God asks Jonah again, are you justified in being angry? And this time Jonah says, yeah, yes I am. I am absolutely, I have a right to be angry. I deserve shade. Nineveh deserves fire. Do you realize, God, what you just did? Do you realize this is a group of people who's going to come against your people again? When they have enough power, they're going to do it again. They're going to hurt us again. They represent a military threat to your chosen people. To Jonah, it makes no sense to show mercy to evil people while God's own chosen people are suffering in this kind of heat. He is the representative of it. I am suffering in this heat, and you're letting them thrive. But Jonah doesn't see the irony of his self-pity and his pride. Jonah is such a departure from the other Hebrew prophets. He is really, I said this two weeks ago, he is really so much more like us. We can empathize with Jonah way better than we can with any other prophet. He refused to listen to God. He runs from God's presence. He never repents from his behavior. Uh, he writes this beautiful psalm in there, but he never says, I'm sorry. He blames God for his predicament. He accuses God's mercy of being evil. He is resentful of the mercy shown to an undeserving, but then repentant Nineveh. Jonah is disobedient. He is faithless. He is a blasphemous prophet. Yet he is incredibly successful. Jonah has been God's enemy since the very first verse of this book. He has been mercifully, and yet, yet, even though he's God's enemy, he has been mercifully and undeservedly shaded by this plant and from the heat. And since Jonah wasn't getting it, he's not getting it. He thinks his anger is so deserved, so merited, and so righteous. God calls out Jonah and his hypocrisy. Jonah didn't care. You didn't, Jonah, you didn't care or water this plant. You didn't tend to it. You didn't even create it. So God ends this chapter with a question. If you are justified in caring about that plant that you did not create, you did not earn, am I not justified in showing mercy to 120,000 people who I did create in Nineveh? Now, we never hear Jonah's response to the question. The question is intentionally left and unanswered. And we can predict and try to guess what Jonah does at that point in time. We can Google it and try to see, where does Jonah go from here? But really, this is how, how the book of Jonah functions as a parable for uh, us. We, we are, as the reader, left with this opportunity to answer the question for ourselves. When faced with a similar situation, would we have prayed for Jonah, Nineveh's deliverance? Would we have prayed at opposite of Jonah? Because we can be just as faithless, just as disobedient, and just as blasphemous as Jonah. 
It's not what God does that Jonah has a problem with. It's who God does it for. Jonah is mad that these are people who he has no relationship with. Jonah's mad because of the hatred in his heart and his inability to forgive Nineveh for all of their past wrongs and transgressions. Not because of what God does. And Jonah here, sitting on this hilltop, he, he learns a lesson. He has an opportunity to see his hypocrisy and his own pride to look in the mirror and learn a lesson about who God is and who he is created to be. It's a lesson that all of us get the chance to learn as we practice our Christian faith. It's not about us. It's not about us. And that's a hard lesson. Maybe because we live in a a very individualistic society, a society that promotes you get yours, you deserve what you what you um, get, right? Maybe maybe it's just it's not about us. It's so countercultural. Jonah wants God to want what Jonah wants. Jonah wants God to be forgiving, just not to the Assyrian people. Jonah wants conditional love. And as strange as this sounds, as much as we say we really want all of God's unconditional love, we want to love like God does as well, the fact that God's love is truly unconditional, it can make us angry. Um, this past December 14th, I took a moment for my day to pause and pray for the families of the kids who would right now be 17 or 18 years old. Had it not be for Adam Lanza, who back in 2012 walked into Sandy Hook Elementary and shot. He killed 20 kids and six adults that day. And maybe it's because at that time I had a second grader in school that that just hit me hard. I found myself so grief stricken by that shooting. And when Jonah came home, my son Jonah came home from school that day, I couldn't believe how thankful I was to have him come home. And every single year, somehow the Holy Spirit reminds me, it's the 14th. And I pray, and I pause. Well, it was around December 14th that I started to plan out this Jonah series. Okay, I started to make notes about what we're going to talk about for each of this. And as I was planning out the sermon series on Jonah, I noticed this connection between Jonah's parable and lesson and a story I once heard from Pastor Nadia Bowles Weber. She's a Lutheran pastor that I follow and is very wise. And she wrote this lesson and, and talked about it on one of her podcasts about the Sandy Hook shooting. So Nadia was preparing for uh, lessons and carols that weekend when that shooting happened. And she decided that that Sunday they needed to have a special reading. They needed to read off um, all the names of the 26 adults and children who died at Sandy Hook. And she talked to her worship leader. She said, this is how we're going to do it. You're going to toll a bell just like we do in All Saints. And we're going to allow time to pause. Um, and then you ring that bell and read each name for the 26 people. And the worship leader replied, you mean 27, right, Nadia? And Nadia asked, what do you mean 27? And he said, well, Adam Lanza died that day too. She said, no way, no way. We are not lifting up his name. We are not uttering his name in the sanctuary. And the worship leader felt really quiet and just scared at her for a moment. And she knew, she knew deep down that he was right. But it took her a while to process through why she had so much anger and bitterness in her heart about it. And in this interview, we got to hear about Nadia talking about it. She shared with us how she wrestled with herself about God's grace for someone who is so despicable. And this is what she said. One of the most important aspects of Jesus' birth that we celebrate in the Christmas season is that John's Gospel says that a light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. God chose to enter at a time just as violent and just as faithful, faithless as our own, but the other thing that we must confess is that the light of Christ cannot, will not, shall not be overcome by that darkness, ever. Not by Herod. Not by Adam Lanza. And I would add, not by Nineveh. 
And at their Sunday service, Nadia read off each name one by one. The worship leader struck a bell. And she said that before she could get to that final name, she had to pause. She couldn't get to it right away. She had to take a minute to reach really deep into her theological convictions to find the mercy to read his name out loud. And then she read his name. And they prayed. God came to save all of us. God created us in God's image. And the lives that we would rather ignore, step over, extinguish, lock away, they are still so incredibly precious to God. And so in obedience to God's command to love our enemy and pray for those who persecute us, we have to dig deep. And we have to dig deep and we have to do just that. To pray for our enemies and for those who persecute us. This is the hard truth that we find in the book of Jonah. This is the lesson that God has been trying to teach so many people, has been trying to teach Jonah if he could just pay attention to what is going on here. And we joke sometimes about this book being about some silly fish, and, and all the while, it is the most challenging, gut-wrenching books that we have in Scripture because it forces us to wrestle with the same questions that Jonah faces in all 48 verses. Can we respond to God's call even when we wholeheartedly disagree? Even if it benefits our enemy? Can we acknowledge God's desire to save us from ourselves even when we know we don't deserve it? Can we repent and turn from our selfish ways? Can we do it just like the Ninevites did? Can we love our enemies and offer them God's mercy and grace? And I would say, yes, we can. I believe that we can. I know we can. But it is only with God's help. It is why Jesus Christ came. It is why we gather together as a faith community to remind ourselves. It's why we have to listen to the Holy Spirit. It is why we have to pay attention to what God sounds like when God speaks to us. But we cannot do it by our own self-will. We will be just as selfish as Jonah. We cannot do it by our own gumption and strength. We have to have God's help. And this example that we find in Jonah, this example that we find in Nadia's story about Sandy Hook, these are the hardest versions of this principle. To love and to forgive someone who has taken every single thing from you, it is the hardest thing to do. And this is hard because it is not possible by our human ability. It is only possible because God goes with us to the Nineveh, God goes with us and walks alongside us to give us the ability to do it. <coughs> but friends, this is what I want you to just sit with in this good news moment, is that God loves us. God offers mercy and abundant life to all of us. And I want you all to sit in that good news and just let that comfort you and give you some peace today that you are a child of God. You are a blessing. You are called by God. And that is life-changing grace. It's also life-changing grace to someone you don't like. It is especially life-changing grace to someone you hate. Friends, being a Christian isn't about us. It's about loving others. And it's about going with God so we can love them. So who deserves that love and mercy this week when they're so undeserving? Let us pray. God, I hope we, we want you oh, to say that we are it. We're the ones who are good people who get everything that you give to us and it's only for ourselves. We want to say that we're people who want everyone to experience your grace and mercy, but we know deep down that there are times we just want to hold on to it for ourselves. You call us to go where we are needed. You call us to love everyone, but especially you call us to love our enemies. May we turn to you as, as you turn to us so that we have that strength. We can lean on you and your grace to do just that. God, thank you for always pursuing us with more mercy and grace than we deserve. Thank you for encouraging us to go out into the world and to love others. 
Help us to do just that this week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him and seek to grow in his likeness. So let us draw near with faith as we make our humble confession out loud and with the strength of our neighbors and friends in this room and as we prepare to receive this holy sacrament. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. And we have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And that proves God's love for us. So in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, for your creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all of the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join in their unending hymn, singing, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, and holy is your church. Blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering and death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, and you delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and you made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night which Christ gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave God thanks. He took the bread, he gave the, the, broke the bread, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when supper was over, he took the cup. He gave God thanks again, gave it to all his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from this as often as you gather in remembrance of me. And so in the remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we all proclaim together the mystery of faith. That Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here together on these gifts of bread and wine, and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, so that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all of the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. To your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And let us uh, be the disciples who are, have a difficult task before us and who struggle each and every day, but do it well with God's strength. Let us say the prayer that Jesus taught Christ taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our communion helpers, please come forward. We know that we are not worthy of all that Jesus did for us and sacrificed for us. And so sometimes we can refrain from participating in these opportunities to come back and return and back to God. But that's, that's what we're called to do each and every time. And we do it by God's grace and strength and not by our own. And so that's what communion is all about too. Every minute of every day we have an opportunity to turn back to God, to turn away from our selfish preferences and our desires. And every week we gather as a faith community to participate in the sacrament of Holy Communion to remind ourselves what Christ did for us. And we get to start over again with a clean slate. And so 
This table is extended, this invitation is extended to all of you. This table is open to everyone within the sound of my voice. So I hope that you will come forward and participate. You receive a piece of the bread, dip it into the juice to receive both elements at once, and you can return to your pew in an attitude of prayer, or you can kneel at the prayer rail, whichever you find yourself more called to do this morning.
take you where God wants to take you. Accept and trust in the salvation that God offers you. Repent and turn from your evil ways and go and share that love and grace of God to others. Seems like an impossible task. But we go to from this place with the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.